as you mentioned, uh, you know, every time we get ready for a presidential election, uh, it's always said that you cannot get to the White House without going through the battleground state of Ohio. Uh, I represent uh, Hamilton County, uh, which is uh, used to be a Republican county, and I represent a district where President Obama uh, had to win. Uh, I had to have a 70% turnout for him. Uh, and they said to me, they said, I know you're a state representative, but if he doesn't get 70% turnout in uh, Hamilton County, he doesn't win. I mean, in your district, he doesn't win Hamilton County, he doesn't win Hamilton County, he doesn't win Ohio, he doesn't win Ohio, he doesn't get to the White House. So that was a, a lot of pressure. But I'm glad that we delivered from the 33rd district all the way to the White House. I'm also um, pleased to um, be back here, and this time I'm back as the president of the Ohio Legislative Black Caucus. And um, thank you. And we have uh, 17 members uh, between the House and uh, the Senate. So you can imagine, in the House, there's 99 of us. Uh, so we have a major battle in terms of representation. Um, and we fight every day to keep those seats. Ohio, as you know, as I said, is the battleground state and you can't get uh, to the White House without going through Ohio. But the election for 2016 begins right now. Um, we have a major battle going on as it relates to a lot of issues that we will talk about during uh, this uh, convention. But the big piece is uh, voting rights. And when I got the privilege and honor and was humbled to be asked by Reverend Sharpton to speak at the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington, where Nan brought over 300,000 people to Washington, D.C. Um, at that time, we had just got the devastating news about the Voting Rights Act and Section 5 being deemed unconstitutional. I will tell you that my days uh, in college at Grambling State University, where we used college ID and was able to defeat uh, KKK former uh, Grand Wizard David Duke from being governor, and Grambling is still swinging in the day. I always ask when I was on campus, why do we have to worry about uh, is the Voting Rights Act going to be renewed? And at that time, I was this college student, and we were ready to get, you know, let's get a Constitution amendment in the United States Constitution. And I was told by some of my elders, they say they would never be crazy enough to touch the Voting Rights Act. And so as I fast forward, uh, in Ohio, one of the states that the conservative group, ALEC, uh, who has put together a plan, while we were fighting to get the White House, and we were successful, uh, they were putting a state-by-state -state plan together where they have a cookie-cutter approach to legislation. So whether it's in Ohio, whether it's in Florida, whether it's in Pennsylvania, you're seeing all of these um, pieces of legislation where we're losing everything that we fought, our ancestors fought and died for, we're losing at a state-by-state. -state. We're going back to state rights instead of federal rights. So with that being said, um, at the March on Washington, I started to think about, as I stood where Dr. King stood, um, how do we take this to the next level? Uh, we went from uh, slavery to freedom. We went from those freedoms to uh, the Voting Rights Act, and that was temporary. So now what is it for our generation? What will we leave behind? And so it's important now, and I thought at that time, and I said at the uh, March on Washington, no more temporary solutions to permanent problems. <laughs> And what that means is the Voting Rights Act has to always be renewed. And what I found inside of the state house walls at, at, uh, at, in Ohio is that it, after the Bush debacle, we had what they called bipartisanship. Uh, we were able to put together, uh, everybody was worried about the hanging chads. So we, the Democrats and the Republicans got together and they put these laws and bills together and they created early voting. So now in Ohio you can vote on weekends. We had souls to the polls. And you can go to the polls on Sundays after church. Uh, we had uh, provisional ballots, so if you go into the room and you go to the wrong table, they don't send you away, they get a provisional ballot and they count those ballots. And the premise was, that even if we open 24 hours, they thought African Americans would not come out to vote in record numbers. Even if we open 24 hours, college students would never come out and vote in record numbers. Low income families would not vote in record numbers. Latinos would never vote in record numbers. 
and there was a guy by the name of Barack Obama that came along, and we came out in record numbers, and so now they're saying, oh my gosh, we've got to change these things. And they're able to change them, because one, they have done the redistricting, so, the, so it's like going to a basketball game and you already know the winner, you're just showing up for window dressing. And um, because of that, and because it wasn't permanent, now we find ourselves where we have to beg Banner. Will Boehner do the right thing? We're praying, oh Lord, will Clarence Thomas do something right? No. We're doing all of this begging because we don't have anything permanent. So we launched with the National Action Network, and Ohio is the first stop. We launched an Ohio voter bill of rights to be put in the state constitution. We start in Ohio, but we don't end there. We do the ALEC approach by going state by state. So we launched it first in Ohio being the battleground state. And the Ohio Voter Bill of Rights, what it does is takes our voting rights and puts it in the Constitution. I always say we weren't thought about on the original writing of the Constitution, but we will write ourselves in. And so now it begins to allow the people to have a voice. So we were able, we got past the Attorney General with our language, and God has been so good. We got past the ballot board with our language, and so now we're out collecting. We have to turn in 385,264 good signatures of voters to put it on the ballot this November. Now what does that do? There's three ways that you can affect change. You can litigate, you can legislate, or you can activate. And we are now talking about activating. So now that people say, well what are you going to do this election? President Obama's not on the ticket. I said, well if we can do it for President Obama, we can do it for ourselves. And so that's what we're trying to do now, is move now, taking the things that we gained and try to make those things permanent. And I'm excited that the National Action Network is with us. And Chris Matthews, this is the message that we're sending to anybody who wants to run for President of the United States. Don't show up in Ohio in 16 if we don't see you in 14. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mr. Let me ask now Representative uh, Reggie Fullwood uh, and Representative uh, Alan Williams. We talked about Ohio. There are a lot of challenges in Florida, the state of Florida as well. And the question is, have we overcome that challenge? It's going to be another issue for 2016, 2014, beyond. Have we resolved it? Thank you, Professor. I'll be happy to start off. Um, and in Florida, unfortunately, we have a pretty bad reputation as it relates to voting. Uh, <laughs> Representative Reese talked, mentioned the uh, 2000 election with Gore and Bush, and we know the hanging Chad, pregnant Chad. We didn't, before that, we didn't even know what a Chad was. <laughs> um, but we, we, we fixed that somewhat, and in 2000, uh, our Republican-led legislature, uh, and Representative Reese mentioned the group ALEC. Well, they, they have this cookie cutter approach so that they went around the country and created these voter suppression laws. So they made it tougher for students to vote, register to vote. They made it, uh, they decreased early voting because they figured out, hey, folks who look like most of you in the room, early vote at a higher rate. So, and you folks were voting for the wrong people. So they decreased the amount of early voting and did a couple of other things that made it hard to vote, not only in Florida, but in every state where Republicans have a majority in the legislature, that was the game plan. And they were successful in most states. So we are, you know, although President Obama won uh, Florida in, in 2012, there were long lines. Uh, you probably, you know, saw it on the news. Chris probably talked about it quite a bit. Long lines. People were essentially disenfranchised. And we fixed that last session. Uh, and, but it wasn't because, you know, there was a willingness by Republicans it was because they had to, because of the embarrassment, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, so th that challenge exists. So we, we're constantly, uh, Representative Williams and I, he's the chair of our Black Caucus, our Legislative Black Caucus in, in Florida. So there's a constant battle uh, against those folks. And again, it's that cookie cutter approach where they are, while you know, we were celebrating victories and celebrating President Obama, they were working on a master plan to, again, create hate to not only not only to hurt the president's reputation, but how do they get back in office using hate? And 
And I don't know if most of you remember, they used a, a similar strategy against President Clinton as well. And to, towards the end of his last term, there was a lot of hate. Um, some of it, you know, was related to some of his, um, some bad decisions he made. Um, but it's a similar game plan. So uh, what we do, what we're trying to do in Florida as it relates to voting rights as well, uh, we have some legislation that we're struggling to get heard. And, and, and that's one of the tough parts when you're the minority. You know, we struggle to get good legislation heard related to voting rights to protect uh, our rights to make sure that all of you have the, those rights to vote and have access to the polls. Um, so that's one of the challenges we have, and we're, we're fighting a good fight, just like our, our brothers and sisters in Ohio and everywhere else. And I'll let uh, Representative Williams talk a little bit, a little bit more about what we're doing before. And Reverend, if you can say, uh, Representative Williams, if you can say something about uh, Arthena Joyner, who's in the state senate, the Senate uh, for Florida. Uh, and I don't know how many African Americans are there or supporting the issues as well, but what about the representation of African Americans as well, if you can say a word about that? Sure. First of all, man, it's great to be here. Uh, my name is Alan Williams, uh, state representative from Tallahassee, Florida. Yeah. Uh, proud to be here. Yeah. And uh, proud to join this distinguished panel. My colleague, uh, Alicia, she's the chair of the Black Caucus in Ohio, the battleground state where I'm the chair of the Black Caucus in Florida, the swing state. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, this is a great conversation to have. And it's a great conversation to have because in 2010, a lot of us, we went to sleep. You know, we got our Ebony's, we got our Jet magazines, we saw President Obama on front, we changed all the pictures we had that used to have MLK, JFK, and Jesus. And we put, you know, Obama in there and, and you know, we felt good. Um, but we have to wake up, and we have to wait. We can't wake up in 2016. We have to wake up in 2014, right? Because we have to want to make sure that the president's agenda is able to be carried out. If we don't do that, then those next two years or the three years that Chris talked about are going to be some of the hardest years we've seen in a, in a generation. And so it's up to us to do that. So the work that Alicia's doing uh, in Ohio is, is critical, but we also have to do that in other states. We have to start moving the needle. So when you go back to your states, it just can't be a conference where we talk and just talk and talk. It has to take, we have to take action. That's what the action is in, in National Action Network. And so as Re Representative Bull will talk about, you know, we, the, oh, the Obama voters, right? We're not to join forces with the Hillary voters, the ones who are excited and ready for Hillary to be on the ballot in 2016. We have to get them excited for to vote in 2014. We can't wait for them to be uh, crunk and hype and ready to go in 2016. We need them to be crunk and hype and ready to go in 2014. And so, you know, I sit on the DNC, and I will tell you that one of the most exciting things that I've heard uh, from the president and from OFA is that the Obama machine will be unleashed, right? In 2010, we know that they kind of kept that, you know, bottled up, and they kind of kept it the Jimmy in the bottle. Well, the president has said that all of the tools, all of the things necessary to be successful, like they were in 08 and 12, will be unleashed, and Representative Congresswoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz, who's the Congress, the chairman of DNC, will have those tools at her resource, at her, uh, uh, to use to make sure that all states that were successful will continue to move the needle. And what's so critical about that is states like Georgia, right, who are right on the, are right on the precipice of being a blue state or at least a purple state. Uh, Texas, Texas is a few cycles away of being a purple state, right? We, kind of, we consider ourselves a purple now, kind of shading toward light blue, at least on statewide elections in Florida. But that's, that's where we are. So when you go back to your states, you got to continue to press that needle, move the ball. We got to get more folks registered to vote, right? And when we talk about absentee ballots, you can't wait. As Reggie talked about, early voting, that's, that's, that's number one. But we have to get more of our folks who are sick and shut in at the churches, who can't get out early vote. We got to make sure that they're getting their absentee ballot filled out early and make sure they get it turned in so it's accurate. 